understand that. Uh, what is the charity chapter of the Bible? It's 1 Corinthians 13. Did you know the exact phrase, love of God, is mentioned exactly 13 times in the King James Bible? Here you have 12 disciples walking around, but who's with them? Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that number 13 can represent the pure love of God. And that love is always a giving love because pure love just gives. It never takes, it just gives. Then we have the adulterated love, the harlot love, represented by the number 13, represented by Mystery Babylon the Great. She always takes, and she has a motive or a reason why she wants to give. I want you to stop and think about a lot of the religious ideas that are in what's called churches today, a lot of the practices, a lot of the fruit that's being born in these churches, and a lot of the ideas behind some of the doctrines that are being taught, like the Word Faith Movement. The Word Faith Movement says you worship God so that you can get something out of it. The Word Faith Movement says that you do rituals or you say the right words, in order, not because you just truly love God, but because you love yourself and that you know that according to what they teach, that if you do all these certain things and say these certain words and perform these particular practices, then you will get something out of it. That's, that's not love. That is not God's pure love. If you love God, you do things for God expecting nothing in return. You do it because you love God and that's how God loves you. So you can always see the spirit of harlotry inside of it. Let's say a family or inside of a church or in a nation or whatever, is that you, you see what's going on and are people doing what they're doing in order to get something in response or to get something back. That's, that's harlot love. So 13 word title here, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, an Abomination to the Earth. And I saw the woman drunken. Okay, so think of wine and strong drink and alcohol and fornication. She's drunken with the blood of the saints. We have taught many, many times in this broadcast and our Bible studies and our Sunday sermons that the spirit of this world hates the spirit of Christ. And this, this drunken harlot woman, she hates the Bible and she hates God's people. She cannot stand them. Jezebel does not like Elijah and she wants him dead. I want you to think about that. Um, and those who are governed and ruled by Mystery Babylon the Great, they don't, if you stand for this Bible and you stand for the blood of Christ and you stand for righteousness and holiness, they don't like you. And they will curse you. And I have video of a pastor that did curse you. Okay? I'm going to show you that. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. I like that. The word mystery is found 22 times in the King James Bible. And every time it's found, it'll tell you the mystery. Behold, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I show you a mystery. He is revealing the mystery. Things that were secret in the Old Testament now revealed in the New Testament. He says, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Think about it, a woman and a beast carrying her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Now, I asked you earlier to draw sort of a picture in your mind. Now, everybody has a different idea of what this looks like. Um, somebody sent me an, uh, an advertisement of all things now for vodka, absolute vodka, okay? Uh, that is strong drink. Wine and strong drink always sort of go hand in hand in the Bible. And that's what Mystery Babylon represents. She represents the spirit of drunkenness. So here he is, here it is, the, um, the advertisement that somebody sent me. We have the, the, the wine and the strong drink, vodka. Um, we have a beast that's actually a dragon. I mean, th you, you get who the dragon is, don't you? Uh, he has uh, multiple horns here. She's the the dragon is carrying the woman, who um, let me just uh, let me just stop right here. Th this woman, uh, this is not this is not how I want my wife going out in public. Okay, man, I, my wife doesn't 
doesn't dress up like this and flash her legs to everybody that walks along and looks lascivious. That's not how Christian women ought to look. And you know, the sad thing is, this is what we see. I have a friend of mine that goes to a church and he says, Mike, I'm sick and tired of the way the women in our church are dressing. He said, I, I'm tired of it. In church, they're dressing this way. So this is not this is not the glorious bride of Jesus Christ sitting here on this beast, on this dragon, is it? It's a, it's a lascivious woman dressed in scarlet colors. And um, oh, look at the apples all over the place. Now, I know the Bible doesn't say that the forbidden fruit was an apple, but that's what the newagers, and that's what all the people in the occult and misreligions, that's what they teach, is what that, that fruit was an apple. And uh, so on and so on. So here, I mean, I was just looking at this and I'm going, yeah, there's Mystery Babylon the Great and there's the beast and he's carrying her and she's lascivious and she's full of fornication and she is, she represents a spirit of drunkenness. Boy, whoever made this advertisement either had been reading the Bible very well or they were led by a spirit to do so. So here, uh, this, this is going to, this is going to represent uh, the theme that we're going to do today concerning uh, Mystery Babylon, concerning the, her nature, what it is she's all about. And the sad thing is we see her in the church, in, in, in what used to be the Christian church or the Christian idea or the Christian philosophy. That she is showing up here. Now, the Bible is full of contrast. We have Mystery Babylon here in Revelation 17. And in Revelation 19, we have the appearance of the bride. In Revelation 19, verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Remember, marriage is a picture of Christ and his bride. For the marriage of the Lamb uh, is come, uh, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her that it was granted that she should be arrayed not in scarlet and not in uh, all the deckings that Mystery Babylon has, but she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean, clean, and white. Contrast cleanness with uncleanness. That's what fornication is. It is uncleanness. Uh, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, I will stop right here and let you know that the... Now, in, a, in another translation, which they're wrong, especially the NIV, it says that the, uh, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That is not correct. All of our righteousness are as not fine linen, but they are as filthy rags in God's sight. She, it was granted to her that she should be arrayed in fine linen. She did not come up with this on her own. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. It is not our own righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ. So we have, as Paul said, we have put on Christ. He is our covering. He is our robe of, of white. He is our fine linen, and He is our wedding garment. He is the one who adorns us. Harlots always adorn themselves. And I want you to keep that in mind. So here we have, uh, here we have a, a, an unclean, drunken harlot woman that is not faithful to her husband. And here we have the woman who is faithful to her husband. Her husband is faithful to her. And he has adorned her and beautified her. Read, read Ezekiel chapter 16 if you want a picture of this. God took Jerusalem and he adorned her. He made, he washed her. He, cu he cut the umbilical cord off and, and tied it up and took care of her. He found her when she was, she was a castaway child. And he loved her and he set his love on her and he adorned her and he made her pretty. But you know what she did? She took the beauty and the things that God had given her and she went out and she became a harlot with what God had given her. We're going to see what is happening. I'm amazed. People, people write me all the time. Somebody wrote me an email yesterday. I said, Pastor Mike, I've had it. I'm leaving my church. I can't. I can't take it anymore. I cannot, I cannot stand to see what it is that I'm seeing in my church. And I've been here for 15 years. And she said, I used to be in the occult. I used to be in all these things. And I know what I'm seeing. And I'm out. I can't take it anymore. Because what we're seeing, what we're seeing, not on a limited scale, on a grand scale, is the harloting of the church. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21. Look at, look at what it says. 
how is the faithful city become an harlot? Stop right here. God is, is, is addressing, he's addressing his people. At one time, they were a faithful city. They were right. They were, they were decent. They were, they were loyal to God. They were not out committing adultery against God. At one time, that's how it used to be. How, how many, how many denominations can we say that of? Major denominations, even smaller denominations in this country, at one time were faithful to the Lord. You know why? Because they just believed the Bible. They were faithful to the Lord. They were faithful to the scriptures. They were out evangelizing missionary societies going all over the world, preaching the, preaching the gospel, taking Bibles everywhere. Something happened. Now these denominations have changed from a glorious church without spot or wrinkle to the harlot church. Churches, individual churches and movements and ministries that at one time, at one time we could say, boy, they had it going. At one time they were preaching the gospel. At one time people were being saved. And now we're looking at them now and we're, and we're stepping back from the movements, from the ministries, from the denominations, from the men who have decided to chase the world and go after another spirit, a spirit of harlotry. I have two books in my bedside, Lieutenant. The Marine Corps Code of Conduct and the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Chuck! I hate them! Banana. And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. Entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jack wagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are, coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and we have internet service today. Only I don't have much of a voice. I have uh, refrained myself from speaking too awfully much. Um, I've taken a few phone calls yesterday and so on, but... Uh, I started noticing again Sunday afternoon, um, I noticed that I was getting a little horse in here. Let's see, I got a horse in here somewhere. Where's a horse? That ain't a horse. That's not a horse. That's not a horse. I thought I had a horse. Anyway, I got a little pony here in my throat. And uh, it got worse yesterday. It is a little worse today than it was yesterday. And um, sore throat. I'm all stuffed up here in the sinuses once again. And I'm just going, uh, I don't want strep again. I just recovered from having strep a week and a half ago, about a week ago. And my doctor said, take all the medicine. So I took all the medicine. And I'm going, surely I can't get it again. Was I thought it was like mumps. Once you get mumps, you don't have to worry about it anymore. <clears throat> but anyway, and and some of the people here at, at church, uh, Caleb, my son, sick once again. And there, it's just been going around. It's this been a, a tough winter. Uh, the weather here, the, the, the temperature right outside our top secret broadcasting bunker here in Festus, Missouri, 65 degrees in February. We don't have days like this. And it's going to go down later this week, down below freezing. Then it's going to go back up again. It's crazy. And I, I dare the global warming. No, let's see. Wait a minute. The global cooling. No, that was the 70s. It was global cooling in the 70s, global warming in the 90s. And so now... They can't keep up with, they can't keep their story straight, whether it should be global warming, global cooling. And they talk about how the earth is getting warmer and warmer. And yet, 
places are freezing over that have never froze over in our lifetime. And um, so anyway, the climate change people would have a ball here in the Midwest because our temperatures are changing nearly every day. But it's good to be with you today. We, we had some internet problems last week, and it was one of those things on Thursday where I had a simultaneous um, software crash with the software that we use to stream. Then I had, um, at, at almost exactly the same time, it was a, um, an internet modem crash that we have here. And uh, we actually have two internet connections here at the church, one for office use and general use, and one with, that we reserve for streaming. And the streaming one went out, and my, and my software crashed. And I'm just going, are you kidding me? It almost, and in fact, I can't think of a time when I had a technical issue and a, and a major problem, something going wrong with my computer or the software or the internet towards the end of a Pastor Mike Online live broadcast. It's all, and this, it's not the first time. Thursday was not the first time it happened. It's happened many, if you've been watching this program throughout the years, you've seen how at the beginning of the program, bada boom, bada beam, explosions happen, and we, we have crashes, and I can't do PMO. So anyway, I'm going to talk about today what I was going to talk about Thursday. It would have fit better Thursday because Thursday was a number. It's an interesting number. Um, it was February the 2nd, which a lot of you know, especially in America, that there is an unofficial holiday called Groundhog Day. And I've been hearing this since a child. The groundhog saw its shadow. So there's going to be, what, six more weeks? Or I don't remember. I can never remember how it goes. Um, and I thought, when I would hear this reported on the news, when I was a child, I thought it was like any groundhog anywhere in America. They all simultaneously popped out and saw their shadow. That's what I thought. I didn't know that this was all like pre-scripted in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Uh, didn't know that. Didn't know the guys with the big top hats and so on. They, they're the ones who wrote all this script out. But anyway, February the 2nd, Groundhog Day, is, if you start from January 1st, it is the 33rd day of the year. Now, I've, I've talked about this number before, and to me, it never ceases to grab my attention or, um, let's say, it, there's, all, there's always something else to find out about the numbers that we study in the Bible. Now, I have been accused, I've been accused of a lot of things, but I have been accused of occult numerology or... Uh, the, there's another term for it they use in Jewish mysticism called gematria. Uh, gematria is where letters are assigned a number. And you take the letters of a Hebrew word and you take what that Hebrew letter, what number that Hebrew letter represents, and you add them all up and you get this number. Um, the there's several problems with that. I don't do gematria. I don't. I don't go looking for um, words in my King James or in the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek New Testament. I don't look for um, each n letter having a number. Add that up, and that's some big mystical secret that nobody knows. Uh, I don't do that. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. There's several reasons. Number one, there is no place in your Bible. And to me, it's, it's the Bible is final authority. If the Bible says it, I believe it. If the Bible doesn't say it, I don't, I don't go for it. Um, there is no place in the Bible where it gives you a list of the Hebrew letters and then assigns a numerical value to that letter. 
There's nothing in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There's nothing in the Prophets, nothing in the Psalms. The book of Job doesn't have it in there. It, it's not anywhere to be found, even in the Greek. There's nothing, there is no teaching in the Bible that teaches us a Hebrew letter has this numerical value. Then they add the letters, or the, yeah, the sum of the letters together. And that's some, supposed to be some big mystical secret teaching. Uh, again, the Bible does not tell us to add the sum of the letters, much less give us what those letters, what their numerical value is. Uh, and some would say, well, the ancient Hebrews, they, 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 you know, that's how they wrote numbers. They wrote them with those. Okay. But again, we don't have biblical authority telling us that that's what we're supposed to do. We don't have a verse that says, count these letters and add them up and do this. And you're going to find this. We don't have that. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I was watching a YouTube video one time. This guy, he was, uh, I guess, some sort of new age teacher or something like that. And he was teaching a little bit about gematria. And this is, you know, he, I'm pretty sure he got this from some Jewish rabbis. Because the Jews right now are in darkness. They are the blind leaders of the blind. And gematria... And the idea of gematria is that if you take, like the word Messiah, you take the Hebrew letters of the name or the word Messiah, you, assign, you get their assigned numerical value, and you add that up, and it comes up a number. They said that you can do take the, the Hebrew form of the serpent, which is Nachash. And you take those letters and you add up their assigned numerical value, and this the, the it comes out the exact same number as what the Messiah was. Okay, that that should get some music. Okay, and and I'm listening to this and I'm going, okay, there's a setup coming. This guy is using this gematria to set his people up with false doctrine. And sure enough, he did. He said, because the gematria of Messiah and the gematria of, of the serpent, Nakash, since they are the same number, it must therefore mean that the Messiah is the serpent. Okay? Big, no sir, no way. That's a setup. And so I stay away from gematria. But... The Bible does tell, in fact, let's do this. Let's get our Bibles out. Let's go to Revelation uh, chapter 13. Uh, and, and I'll just say this while you're turning there. Does the devil use numerology? Okay, absolutely. The devil does numerology. That's his religion. And it's the idea that that numbers have a magical power. The way I see in the Bible, I don't see numbers in themselves having a magical power to them, but what I think they're there for is to give us wisdom and knowledge and to understand that God has everything in His order. God does everything in order. He doesn't do anything with chaos, confusion, darkness, disorder, he does that's not how God works. God is a God of order. So there are certain numbers in the occult that have a very um, powerful magical potency, like the number thirty three, um, the number nine, the number eleven. Uh, what other the number seven in the uh, teaching of Kundalini Yoga, where you've got a beast at the base of your spine, and he's gonna he's gonna make the journey up your 33 bones. There's that number to reach your pineal gland. The um, the mystics of India teach that when that beast, that serpent, rises up through your spine that he uh, passes through 
what they call seven chakras, C-H-A-K-R-A-S. Those seven chakras, they say, are energy wheels. And I'm just going, okay, I know what that is. Those seven chakras are devils. And if, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 1 to see the illustration of what a certain group of angelic beings, the cherubs, what they look like, they have the appearance of wheels. So these seven vortexes or these seven chakras, these seven wheels are basically these seven devils that accompany yoga. Mary Magdalene, how many devils possessed her? Seven, I think. And, and by the way, the, the number seven in Jewish Kabbalah is a very powerful, potent, according to them, it's a very powerful number. And I see in the Kabbalah, I see in, in um, Hindu mysticism, where they worship all these multiple gods, I think Mary Magdalene got caught up in maybe the roots of what those religions are now, and she was possessed of those seven, watch this now, those seven spirits. Did you catch that? Mary Magdalene, because she was possessed of devils, she had seven spirits in her. But they were not good spirits. They were evil ones. The opposite of the seven devils that possessed Mary Magdalene, of course, is... Once Jesus forgave her sins, she received the Holy Spirit, and there are seven spirits of God. You find it in Revelation 4. You go look at the uh, menorah, the candlestick in the tabernacle. There's seven candles there. And Isaiah 11 gives you the list. Isaiah 11, 2 gives you the list of the seven spirits of God. By the way, man, I, I'm getting way ahead of myself. In Isaiah 11, chapter, uh, yeah, I got to turn. I got to, since we're talking about this number. And I know I have it in my notes here, but in Isaiah chapter 11, let me get there, where it, it lists the seven spirits of God. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's the first one. And the spirit of wisdom, that's the second one. The spirit of understanding, that's the third. The spirit of counsel, that's number four. The spirit of might, that's number five. The spirit of the knowledge, spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord, that's the seventh one. If you were to take the time, you can, if you're watching this later on, not live, you pause the video and count every word that is in verse 2 of Isaiah 11 in a King James Bible. Okay, so stop the, stop the video. Stop right here. Count those words out. You can go to the Pure Bible Search software page. Download the Pure Bible Search software. You can go to Isaiah 11 too, and you can highlight all the words in verse 2 and at the bottom of the screen it'll tell you how many words you just highlighted you want to take a guess 33 exactly and it, it's a reference to if you look at the previous verse there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots it's jesus and we know by way of the the bible giving us the passover times that Jesus participated in. We know that he was 30 years old when he began his ministry. And then we know that roughly three and a half years later, he's dying on the cross. So that number 33, in this case, points to Jesus Christ. Now, what gives us the, the right or the license or um, the admonition to take the numbers of the Bible seriously. What gives us that? Revelation 13, verse 18. Here is wisdom. I want wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. So what it's telling you in, in Revelation 13, 18, He's going to give you wisdom. And if you have any understanding, you're going to count the number of the beast. Now, remember something, because there are the naysayers out there who say, 
the numbers, the, those numbers in the Bible, they don't have any significance at all. Really? Then why is it that one of the major understandings of the beast, his kingdom, what the false prophet does, and so on, why is it based upon the teaching of, of a number? And he said it's the number of a man, and it's the number of a beast. I don't really understand what exactly the relationship between man and beast has with the number 600, 3, 4, and 6. But he tells you that wisdom comes from counting these things out. Count these things. Give the account of them. Pay attention to the numbers. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. If you have the Pure Bible Search software, you can do this one of several ways. The neat way to do it is up at the, I'm going to pull my software up so I can tell you where it is. Uh, in fact, let me do this right here. I'm going to put it on this screen, and then I will do this right here. Okay? You can go to, see this little button right here? You can go to the 600... And 66th chapter. Let me let me go back here. Let me go to Genesis. Let me start it back here. All right, we're in the Old Testament now, so I'm going to go to the 666th chapter of the Bible. It is right there, Ecclesiastes chapter seven. Okay, pretty cool. All right, now Ecclesiastes chapter seven. To my knowledge, I didn't find the name of the beast in there, but here's what I found. Okay. Uh, Solomon said, all this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it is far from me. And he says, I applied in verse 25, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands is bands, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this is, have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. And so Solomon said, 666 chapter of the Bible. And now you're listening to this and you're going, that doesn't mean anything. Here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you facts. Is what I'm going to present to you. I'm going to present to you facts. I'm telling you that Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is the 666th chapter of the King James Bible. Now, you have to decide whether that's significant or not. You have to decide whether or not that's just a, that's a fluke. That's no big deal. But let me, let me kind of bring this part of it down. If you don't believe that the numbers of the Bible have any significance... Let me give you another verse. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Two witnesses, right? If you come to me and say, you know, I believe that um, I believe that that God really is a, a, a woman, okay? And and I'll just say, uh, okay. Uh, can you give me two or three verses in the Bible? that say what you just said. They can't. And so I don't believe anything that people tell me if they can't give me at least two verses out of the Bible that say what they said. The argument that I got into with a guy a couple weeks ago about the Sabbath day. His idea was, and this comes from Ellen White, that the Sabbath day, if you don't go to church on Saturday, and you go on Sunday, the day of the sun, and they forget that Saturday is named after Saturn. Um, if you go to church on Sunday, you have the mark of the beast and you're going to go to hell. And I said, let's read the law. Exodus chapter 20, which is the, I'm going to give you a fact here. Exodus 20 is the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. Okay? That's, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> But it's also the 70th chapter of the entire Bible, starting in Genesis 1. 70th chapter. Does that number 70 show up anywhere in the Bible? Yeah, it does. Several places. And you have the law, which is 10, the Ten Commandments, multiplied by 7, which is God's number of 
sanctification. God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. He made it holy. And here you have God's holy commandments in the 70th, 70th chapter of the Bible. But anyway, I said to him that fourth, that fourth commandment, and I read it to him, and I said, where does it say in there that I have to go to church only on Saturday, and I can't go to church any other day of the week? And he quoted Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, and I said, I'm hearing you quoting it, but it doesn't say what you just said. And if I don't have two witnesses, I don't believe it. And if I don't have two witnesses, then I know for a fact God will not hold me accountable in heaven because of what you said the Bible said. He's going to judge me on what the Bible says. So incidentally, we have two places in our Bible. One of them is in the Old Testament. One's in the New Testament. They both tell us that wisdom comes by counting. And both of these verses are associated with the exact same number. 600, 3 score, and 6. That is a fact. It is a, it's a fact. It is a provable fact. It is an undeniable fact. Now, again, you may not like what I am presenting to you of what I think these facts mean. You may not like it. But the fact is, two verses, one Old Testament, one New Testament, both telling us to get wisdom by counting, both associated with the exact same number. That's the fact. Um, let's get into that number. Let me, um, oh, I need to push that button. Here we go. Um, the number 33, let me do this, there we go. The number 33, um, I was doing some research uh, this morning, and some days I don't have an agenda of what I'm going to study. Usually it just ends up falling in my lap. Well, somebody had sent me a, a, a YouTube video, and they said, Pastor, you know, we know you're busy and you probably don't have time to watch a lot of videos, but you know, you might want to take a look at this one. So I pulled it up and had a little time, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm, and I'm, I'm listening to the guy. The guy is giving a talk. Um, I've got notes here, what his name was. If you wanted to Google or you wanted to go to YouTube and um, find this guy's uh, videos, his name is, let me find it here real quick in my notes. His name is Mud, I think, or something like that. Where is it? Where is it? The video was called The Future of Fabrication. So you jot that down. And you go take a look at it, all right? But they sent me this, and I'm watching it, and I'm hearing this guy talk. And then up on the screen, he says that he loves to modify genetics. He loves it. He likes, he said, I'm a geek. I like taking things apart and putting them back together in a different way. And he said, I love playing around with genes, all right? Genetics, DNA. He, what he said is, I love rewriting God's book of this world's DNA. That's what he said. I don't care who wrote it. I'm going to mess it up and I'm going to change it. That's what he said. Then he started talking about all these companies that he's associated with. One of them, this got me. This company here called Gen 9. Okay? Now... Gen 9. I looked at it as Genesis 9. And I went back and read Genesis 9. And there's a lot of interesting things in Genesis 9. One of them is the fa that's where we find out that God put a fear in the heart of beasts of the earth, he put a fear of man in them. And devils right now have a fear of the man, Jesus Christ. And they fear his word. They don't like the Bible either. Think about that for a while. So, because the word of God is powerful... And it's very potent, and it and it 
runs off all of these devils that want to invade in your life. Because that book is dangerous to them. Think, think of a, a communist dictator like Kim Jong-un. Do you know what one of the one things in North Korea, there's a lot of things that you can't have in North Korea. Like, you know, three meals a day, stuff like that. One of them is a Bible. You're either shot on sight or you and your family down to three or four generations are thrown into a prison labor camp and you work there for 30 years just because you had a Bible in your house. What does that tell you? That the spirits that accompany Kim Jong-un and all of that communist dictatorship, he's not the only one running the show there. There are spirits behind this thing and they hate the word of God. So they've made it, they've outlawed it. You cannot have a Bible in North Korea. And I'll be honest with you, I may be a little cynical. I think we're getting to that now in the churches. What is that you brought in your hand? A, a friend, brother of ours here at Bethel was a youth pastor over here in Illinois, Assembly of God Church. Him, his pastor had talked about the King James issue many times. His pastor said, you know, that's, you know, that's the old archaic one. We don't use that anymore. We use these new translations because they're based on better manuscripts and all that stuff. So he was in his class on a Wednesday night getting ready for the kids to come in, taught a teen class on Wednesday night. Pastor walks by the classroom door, sees him sitting there at his desk. He's got a Bible open. He goes over there and looks at it. It's a King James. He said, I thought I told you not to have this Bible here any anymore. And that man's heart sunk. And he packed up his stuff and he said, we're done here. You are not going to take away my Bible from me. And I'll tell you something. That that tells me, I don't know who this pastor was, but something tells me that a spirit that is all in this guy hates the King James Bible. Why? Hates it so much that he told his youth pastor, I don't want to see this book in here ever again. That's wicked, people. That's wicked. I can't remember where I was going with that. But it was really good, right? Oh, watch this. In Genesis 9, God put a fear of man into the heart of beasts of the earth. They're afraid of man. They're afraid of... There's just something about man and his genetic makeup that when animals see us, they run. What if... What if... Man's genetics are altered. And they do something with our DNA so that technically we're not humans anymore. And now the beasts of the earth, instead of being afraid of us and running away, they're not afraid of us anymore because we're not human anymore. I can tell you there's no doubt in my, this pastor had, would have had no problem at all if his youth pastor was using the Message Bible, the Holman Standard Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the um, English Standard Version, the Revised Version, any of those other translate the New King James. He wouldn't. Have, he did not have a problem with that. Anybody in his church using any translation. And in fact. They so don't care about what Bible you use that about half of that church's women violate the scriptures because of their gibberish talking during the church service. Ooh, oh, you, didn't, you didn't think I was going to go there today, did you? And what's happened is there are devils all in churches right now because whereas before they were afraid to go in this church because they had the power of the word of God there. But now somebody rewrote the DNA. And now these spirits are going, do you smell a man in here? I don't smell a man in here. He's not here. Woo, let's go. And they go in and they take over that territory. Okay, that's that's Genesis 9. And this this company is all about synthetic DNA 
changing gene synthesis and so on. One of the uh, labs or one of the products that this company has, Genesis 9, is a product called Biofab. And what that means is bi biological fabrication, which basically means we are fashioning DNA and living creatures with the hands of men. They're not built by God. They're built by men. And I was looking at that logo, too. Logos tell a lot. You have DNA. You say, well, it's DNA. But notice the opposites of the colors here. Okay? The opposites of the positions here. One male, one female, one yin, one yang. One is light, one is darkness, one is good, and one is evil. One is the father, one is the mother. Okay? And that these are all Kabbalah terms. Then you have this company here, which is a financial backer. This is an investment company, and a bunch of rich millionaires pool their money together. They go invest in companies, which means that they have a part ownership in it, and the company makes three to four billion dollars in the next five years, and these people that invested in it are raking in a fortune over this. And Agilent Technologies is one of those companies it is a venture capital company, which means that they're looking for startups to give money to in exchange for their profit when they start making it. And I went and I looked. I said, I want to know what their logo is. And here it is right here. Notice that on each of this, this is like the sun. And on each of these rays, you have one, two, three, four dots. So you have four dots here, four here, four here, four here. So that's four, eight, twelve, sixteen. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen here. That total is thirty-two. But there's something here in the middle, but it's hidden. It's just like on the Kabbalah, the Sephiroth Tree of Life. There are there would be ten circles that you would be able to see. But the Kabbalists teach that there is an eleventh circle that's hidden and he'll only be revealed get ready now when Yahweh and his girlfriend or wife or concubine or whatever she is Shekinah is her name and when Yahweh and Shekinah pair together and mate and have ritualistic fornication then the eleventh divine circle is revealed. But right now it's hidden. And what you have here, you have 32 points here, points of light, and a 33rd one hidden here in the middle. You have a number 33 here. Okay, and there's other logos that, that I will show you if, if I have time today. That this same thing, the Jesuit logo. Go Google it right now. Go look at the Jesuit logo logo it's a sun with 32 rays coming out of it go look at the um uh let's see here the old japanese navy flag you know like in world war ii they had the they had the red sun with these rays coming out of it there's 32 rays around that thing with the sun the middle part being the 33rd part same as the jesuit logo same as the logo of this company okay now, Groundhog Day, 33rd, 33rd day of the year. If you've not seen the movie Groundhog Day, I'm not going to tell you to go watch a movie, all right? Uh, that's not for everybody. But I look at these things, and I, I watch them repeatedly sometimes, and I pick up things that are in the movie that were put there deliberately. In this story, Bill Murray plays this, um, this TV weatherman from Pittsburgh, and him and his producer and a camera guy have to go to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania to cover Punxsutawney Phil coming out, seeing his shadow. And he hates it. He's very arrogant. That He's trying to boost his career, and he knows that going to Dogtown, Pennsylvania is not going to further and advance his career. And so he's angry. He's mad at everybody. And he's very, he just wants what's for him. Well, he goes to bed, wakes up the next day, 
and it's Groundhog Day again. And the next day, it's Groundhog Day again. What he's doing, he's reliving, get ready, he's reliving the 33rd day of the year every single day. As he keeps doing this, he increases in knowledge, he increases in abilities, he speaks French, he's been, he's been repeating this day so long he learned French, he learned how to play the piano, all kinds of things. And he says at one point, in fact he's sitting at the diner trying to explain to his producer the chick of the movie that eventually he's going to be in bed with her. That's the goal of the movie is to put him and her in bed together so that he can have this transformation. But they're sitting in the diner and he's trying to explain to her what's happening and he said, I'm a god. And I, I'm just going... That's what that's about. The uh, Listen to me now. The ascension of mankind Masonry involves going in levels and repeating things. Indian uh, Hindu mysticism, the doctrine or the teaching of reincarnation is, is that you must relive life over and over and over again until you reach what they refer to as the perfected state called nirvana. The problem with nirvana is is that the word literally means to blow out as like a blowing out a candle. Don't you think about it. God put a candle of light in every one of us. And there are curses in the Bible whereby God said, I'm going to take your candle away. Remember what Jesus said to, I uh, can't remember what church it was, Laodicean or one of the other churches. He said to them, if you don't shape up and do what I say, I'm going to take your candle out. And the word nirvana literally means blow the candle out. And they say when you reach that utter darkness where everything is out of order, you have achieved the perfect nothing and you're a god. And that's what this movie is based on. There's even in the background, I noticed this. Somebody's holding a microphone with the number 33 on it. Okay? I mean, that... If you, th if you think I make this stuff up, I mean, take a look at it. They're, he's reliving and, and ascending to Godhood. And, and by the way, he can't get out of that loop that he's in until he ends up committing adultery and fornication with the woman. A sacred ritualistic thing must happen. The, the, the yin and the yang have to come together before he can achieve his godhood. It's crazy stuff in that movie. There is also a what, what's called a, a cross-quarter day. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but the, the um, I hate to call it a holy day, an unholy holiday. Okay? called Imbolc or Candle Mass, all right? And it has to do with um, awakening the earth goddess, and, and that kind of ties in with the groundhog. The groundhog sort of represents this, I guess, this beast that's rising up to declare that we're either going to have a, a fertile spring or we're not going to have a fertile spring or something like that. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but do you remember this movie? It's called The 33. And I, I watched this movie. Um, I can't remember how many months ago. But I remember this event taking place. And I remember hearing the news reporters. I remember seeing it on Drudge Report. How they were saying that 33 miners were trapped underground in a pit... And they were trapped there, and the goal was they decided not to just let them die in there, that they were actually going to try to, what, get this now, 
they were they were going to try to open up a portal so that the 33 could be taken out of the pit they were in and brought out to earth and what's really interesting is that when they figured out how they were going to do it they drilled this massive hole open up this portal and they sent down a, a very small capsule and they named the capsule the Phoenix the Phoenix is a some say it's a mythological bird I don't think it's a myth I think the Phoenix is a corrupted concept of the beast of Revelation 13 the Antichrist because the phoenix dies in the flames. Think about it. Where's the beast right now? He's down in the flames. He is like Shiva, surrounded by a circle of flames. That's, where, that's who the beast is. That's what the phoenix is. The phoenix perishes or dies in the flames. But out of the ashes of the rises up a new reborn phoenix. Revelation 13, let's go back to there. Let's see the significance of that. Um, remember the beast has what? How many heads? I, I almost said, well, 33. No, it has seven of them. Now watch this. In Revelation uh, 13, 2, and the beast uh, which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now, you, you just, I remember as this event is unfolding 33 trapped down in a pit, the phoenix going down into the pit. Man opening the pit up and then bringing the 33 out of the pit by way of the phoenix. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, number one, I d there's, if you don't believe in spirits and yet you believe in conspiracy theories, your conspiracy theories never work. Because there's no way that a an elite group called the Illuminati trapped these 33 miners down in the ground no way because essentially what happened was they were they were digging they were drilling and they were mining way down underneath this mountain and basically the mountain there was a big huge like two-thirds of this whole mountain just collapsed down and trapped them down in there man did not do this Spirits did this. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, they're the ones that did this. So if, if I, I, would, I would say you could probably watch that movie and it's going to give you sort of a factual thing of what happened here, but just remember that this, this ritual was performed for the entire world. The 33 gets to come out of the pit. And when he does, the world rejoices. Because everybody did. I don't know if you remember that, but everybody was all happy about it. Oh, by the way, this is from iTunes. Look at the date that they expected to release the um, iTunes version of this. i got to hit music for that. February 2nd, they're going to release the movie, The 33, on the 33rd day of the year. That's a fact. Is it a coincidence? I, I can't, I don't think so. I don't believe that it's, I think this is purposely done. Because, remember, what, what the Bible gives us as numbers is for our wisdom and our understanding. But in the occult, the devil and, and those who practice magic, witchcraft, 
uh, white witchcraft, black witchcraft, doesn't matter what kind of weird occult thing people are doing, they actually believe that numbers have, they have a lot of power. And you'll find witches, you'll find pagans, you'll find people on certain days of the year because of the, what number it is. Or um, saying a, a string of certain words because of how many words there are and so on. In other words, they practice numerology because they think it gives them power. And I don't doubt Somebody made the decision that we're going to release the, the movie, the number 33, on the 33rd day of the year. Somebody somewhere ordered this to take place knowing, at least in their mind, the significance of it. Here's another movie. It's uh, part of the uh, Terminator series. It's the latest installment in the Terminator. In this one, Sarah Connell... Connor and Kyle Reese traveled from 1984 to 2017. 33 years. They go from 1984 to 2017, which is 33 years, to find that John Connor has become a hybrid. In case you've noticed, I when I hit the uh, dun 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 button, I drink something. I'm trying to keep my throat lubricated, so. I'll read things like, which they call the Holy Grail. Look at that. <sighs> See, that's why I do that. But anyway, Connor has become a hybrid. John Connor. Look at his initials. J. C. Because in the Terminator movies, only J. C can save the world. You get that? The initials JC, like Jesus Christ, he's the savior that can save the world. And he's like skipped time 33 years. And he's become a hybrid. He is half human and half machine, computer. And he's built the new Skynet, which they call in this scene, this scene right here, they call it the Holy Grail. And they refer to it at, at, as its launch as a child being born. Like 1 Samuel 4, where you have Ichabod being born. The glory is departed. The man of sin, the Holy Grail, is going to be revealed. And that number is 33 in that movie. Um, look at this one. This is the Man of Steel movie. I counted. This is a new thing. For me. I just, I'm going back to counting words in the Bible. I, I haven't done it for a while. I've been studying a lot of things, but here just lately, I'm just seeing more patterns in the Bible I never saw before. In Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2, if you count those words in those two verses together, you get the number 46. came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. 46 words. Now, if you think that that, I'm just being silly, then I'm going to show you something that will connect to that. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Some of you already know this. In Genesis chapter 2, in a King James Bible, King James, if you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, you have where God made the woman out of the rib of man and brought the woman to him, and he looks at her and says these words, starting in verse 23. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. 46 words exactly. 46 words that Adam speaks. Exactly. That is a fact. And then when you look at Genesis 6, 1, 2, 46 words exactly. But notice that the comparison between the two. They both deal with the joining together of husband and wife. Both of them do. Um, take a look at this here. 
This is the uh, headstone of Jonathan Kent. If you don't know anything about the Superman, his earthly name is Clark Kent. Jonathan Kent is not his father. In this particular movie, The Man of Steel, Jonathan Kent dies. And I, I stopped the movie. The theater people got really ticked off at me. I'm just, I'm just kidding. That was pretty good. Nineteen fifty one to nineteen ninety seven, do the math. How old was Jonathan Kent, Cal L's earthly father, when he died? Forty six years exactly. By the way, from February the second, which is the thirty third day of the year, to the spring equinox on March twentieth, it's forty six days exactly. See the witches know this. Pagans who really study the religious concepts of paganism. Paganism basically is witchcraft wrapped up in leaves, I guess, okay? They worship earth things. And these numbers are very, very high on their list. February the 2nd being uh, in bulk or candle mass is known in witchcraft as one of the cross quarter days. The quarter days are the solstices and the equinoxes of which March 20th is the spring equinox. So in the ritualism of Wicca or paganism or earth worship or whatever they want to call it, February 2nd being the 33rd day of the year, but between February 2nd and March 20th, you have 46 days, which matches. And in case you don't you haven't picked up on this or your first time, this is your first time listening. Human DNA is packaged in 46 chromosomes. Exactly. And when you go back to Genesis chapter 2 in the King James there, when Adam said, this is now bone of my flesh, flesh of my flesh. Um, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. When Adam joined to his wife, Eve, she conceived. Adam donated 23 chromosomes. Eve donated 23 chromosomes. And the child that came out of them with 46 chromosomes was the image of both man and woman in this, in this child. There's a little, you can see the man's features, you can see the woman's features. But that child is the one flesh of those two people coming together. 46 chromosomes, 46 words, 46, Jonathan Kent, 46 years old. Okay? And oh, by the way, at this point in the movie, Cal L, the son of L, of the house of L, L, the two guys that created Superman, they were both Jews. And they knew what El was. El was the Hebrew word for God. Here you have a man from the house of El. He is the son of El, the son of God. And he announces here to the military people, they got him locked up and they don't want anybody around him. And he's saying, you know, you can't keep me in here. And they said, well, just go along with it. You know, you might be carrying some sort of pathogen. And he looks at them and says, guys, I've been here 33 years. And I'm just going, whoa! 33. Who is he? He is supposed to be a JC. A Jesus Christ. A savior. And in this movie... He even goes to a church. There are religious themes all through this movie. He goes to a church and he's really struggling with his identity. And they purposely, behind him, put the um, mural of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he dies on the cross at, at what age? At what age is Jesus in this mural, in this Stained glass painting. He's 33. And there Jesus is struggling about what his duty is. What should I do? And he goes and offers himself a sacrifice. And that's exactly what Cal of the house of El at 33 years old does. And he's counseling with this priest in this church. And the priest tells him, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith first. Now, mm. If you've ever heard that and you believed it, 
Let me, um, well, I, you know, I don't want to get into all that. The idea of taking a leap of faith first, I don't see that in the Bible. What I see is, and it's based on the idea that God is waiting for you to do something so he can do it. I don't see it that way. I think God drags me everywhere he wants me to go and says, here, do this. Okay? Anyway, I won't get into all that. But anyway, they and they, they got him arrested. And they turn him over to the other crypto. By the way, Krypton. You know what the word Krypton means? It's related to the word cryptic, cryptography. And a crypt. A crypt was so called because there was something hidden in it, something sealed in it. Cryptology is the study of secret codes, secret messages. The planet Krypton, these two Jewish guys wrote out this story of Superman, the son of El from the planet Krypton, which means a secret. A secret doctrine concerning this savior of the world, this Antichrist. In the 33rd chapter of the Bible, Genesis 33, you have the city called Shalem. You want to know what that is? It's Jerusalem. The holy city, Jerusalem. Where Jesus, when he was 33 years old, died on a cross. Okay? 33rd book of the Bible. Oh, I like this stuff. 33rd book of the Bible is Micah. Chapter 5. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And what's interesting is, in Matthew chapter 2, Herod gathers all the scribes and says, where is this king that's born? I want to worship him. He's lying through his teeth. He's going to have him killed. So when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together and demanded of them where Christ should be born, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. The identity and the birthplace of Jesus Christ was found in the 33rd book of the Bible. Again, that's a fact. It's a fact. Okay? You count it yourself. I'm telling you, it's a fact. Notice this. So what I'm showing you is, the 33, it can, be, it can refer to Jesus. There's no doubt about it. He was 33. Many things that I and I got more scripture to show you some things that are really really cool things I I just found recently and I've got them in my notes and I thought man I want to share this with everybody or an antichrist and that another Jesus that doesn't come down from heaven he comes up out of a pit. And I remember finding out the phrase Ordo Abkeo. Everybody, you know, if you've studied anything on the internet, you know that Ordo Abkeo means out of chaos comes order. In other words, and, and this is a, a widely accepted concept, and I, I don't have a problem with it at all. Because I know the workings of those who are, and, and with every conspiracy, there is a spiritual aspect to it, and you can't leave that out. But there is also the human aspect of it as well. Spirits will use humans. All right? Um, Ephesians chapter 2. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so the devil and all of his angels, which, by the way, do you know how many angels are on Lucifer's side that are going to be cast out of heaven? 33% of them. That, that's a fact. That is... It's not only a fact, it's a repeating decimal fact. 33.33333333333333. All right? 
you have this eagle with the number 33 on his chest. He's got a crown. That means he's a king. Ordo ab keo. The word keo means the bottomless pit. And Job, you know what? I could probably find this real quick. I'm doing a personal study in the book of Job. All right? There is a place in Job where it talks about man going down to, like, the grave. And um, let's see here. I probably, I, I said I'd be able to find it. I probably won't be. I probably won't be. But it basically says that down there in the valley of the shadow of death, it is a place of darkness, a place where there is no order. Chaos. The word chaos literally means the pit. And so the idea of a new world order is that it is going to rise up. The order is coming out of the chaos, the pit. That's where the beast is. That's where he's locked up. That's where the 33 were. And I, I was mentioned, I was talking, I kind of got sidetracked, but the idea that there is going to be major chaos all over the world because the Illuminati brethren and the spirits behind them know that they can't build a new world while the old world is still standing. Can't do it. So, and we've had pictures of that in our mind. September 11, 2001. You have the two towers, and behold, they are fallen, 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 fallen. And out of the ashes of the World Trade Towers, which there were seven buildings, by the way, that that should be another okay? like seven evil spirits or whatever. Out of the ashes of the two pillars, the two towers there in uh, lower Manhattan rises up a new birth of freedom. One tower to take the place of the other two. Higher than the other two. Freedom to 1776 feet tall. Not, is it feet? Yeah. 1,776 feet tall. 1776. Adam Weishaupt. Illuminati. By the way, the, the NIV in Micah changes the definition of the Messiah, the Christ, because the NIV says whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Let me tell you something. You want to get me fired up? You come at me and say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I love you, but I think you're wrong. I think Jesus uh, is not God and that God created him. And I'll just go. And if you argue with me, I'll go. And if you keep arguing with me, I might. Never know. The number 33 in Freemasonry and the Illuminati and all sorts of occult circles like that, it's always meant to be a hidden concept. But it's a reference to the Antichrist. The 33 bones of your... Oh, I like this. 33 bones of your back. How old was Jesus? He's 33. In Exodus 33, Exodus 33, Moses wants to see God's face. God says, Moses, you'll die. So he said, Moses, I'm going to cover your head. And when I take my hand off your eyes, I want you to look. I'm only going to show you, look what he says in verse 23. Thou shalt see my back part. What was Moses looking at? The number 33. Moses was seeing a foreshadow of, guess who? Jesus, who is the only visible image of God that you and I can tolerate. We right now in our sinful flesh cannot see God's face. And I, I remember reading this here not too long ago. I was doing like a study, like this study of the body about the face. And then I see it in the book of Revelation. We shall see God's face in the new Jerusalem, in the new heaven, the new earth. You and I get to see God's face and we'll live through it. Boy, sweet. 
Psalm, Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. I like this. I like this. Um, let me get a calculator out here. In your... Um, what's going on? In your um, uh, King James Bible, you have 1,189 chapters in the Bible. So what I did was I typed in 1189. Now I'm going to divide that by two, okay? And the number is 594.5. Now what that means is, is that your Bible is divided in half. With 594 chapters on one side, 594 chapters on the other, but because it's an odd number, there's one chapter in the middle. The middle chapter of your Bible is Psalm 117. And Psalm 117 has 33 words in it exactly. Exactly. 33 words. It's like the spine of your Bible. All right? It is the center. And your spine is like the exact center of your body. There's an equal half on one side, equal half on the other. Just like in your Bible, you have equal number, 594 on the left side, 594 on the right side. And the one in the middle only has two verses, but it has 33 words exactly. That's that's Jesus. Okay? I love this stuff, okay? But then you have a corruption of that, right? You have a corruption of that. The seven, I was talking about this a while ago, the seven chakras, seven divine uh, energy vortexes or wheels. The word chakra literally means a wheel. Jesus, take the chakra. Okay, that was just a joke. Uh, Kundalini teaches that there is a beast in a sacred place because the very bottom of your uh, backbone is a uh, it's an upside down triangle like this right here okay you have the lower parts of your back are fused together and they form an upside down tri triangle and it's called the sacrum. And the sacrum literally means sacred place. So you have a little chamber down here, literally at your bum. And this beast needs to rise up the 33, just like those miners in Chile, and activate your pineal gland. And when... Your pineal gland is activated. According to them, you have an awakening. But medically speaking, when your pineal gland is activated, you go to sleep. Because you really do have a third eye in the center of your brain that detects light coming through your eyes. And at night, when the lights are turned off, that pineal gland not seeing the light anymore becomes activated. And when it activates, it releases this little chemical that makes us go to sleep. The next morning, our eyelids are very thin. The next morning, we're still asleep. and But the sunlight is going through our thin eyelids and the pineal gland is detecting that it's daytime now and then it shuts down it quits releasing that sleep hormone and you wake up. All of these churches, all of these ministries, all of these people around the world are talking about we're going to have a great awakening one of these days. Oh, it's going to be a, we need a new awakening. The church, have you heard this one? The church needs to wake up. But let me tell you something about the real church. The real church is not asleep. Paul said it in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. We are of the day and not of the night. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But we are not of the night, neither are we of the darkness. We are children of light, Paul says. And so these 
These people go around telling everybody, their church needs to wake up. The real church is not asleep. That stuff right there, to me, is a setup. By the way, here's the Kabbalah right here. Jewish mysticism. It teaches a doctrine of a Messiah in this symbol right here. Now, if you wanted to venture out and get some books on the Kabbalah and try to study it out, I would say to you, good luck. Because the Kabbalah is probably the most complicated, confusing, esoteric. You'll never, ever, ever figure it out. If that's what you're studying, the Kabbalah. Because, I mean, I've got books on it. I've, I, I, Dave Bradley got me some. He was somewhere. He found them and got them an old bookstore or something like that and gave them to you. Hoggy, you want these books? Yeah, I'll take them. I still got them. But, and I flip through them every now and then, and I'm just going, okay, I don't know what that means. But there's some things I get. This is their tree of life. This is their quintessential symbol, as it were. You have ten circles. What are these circles? They represent wheels. They represent divine beings. They represent angelic creatures. But these lines here joining their circles together. So, you have ten circles. And these lines, the number for these is 22. There's 22 exactly. 22 lines exactly that join together these ten circles. And when these 10 circles join with the 22 paths, think about it. A child is born. Because if you look over at this one here, see this pillar has a plus sign and this one has a minus sign? One of these, and this one's like dark and this one's like white is the male. This is the female. Jim Staley. Jim Staley, who got angry at me and left a message on our phone machine this before he went to prison because I accused him of teaching Jewish mysticism from the Kabbalah. And he said, I don't do that. And then, like six or eight months later, he comes out with this exact graphic and says, oh, this is a beautiful picture of the the masculine part of God and the feminine part of God, which is the Holy Spirit, I'm not kidding you. That's what he said. And they join together and they form Yeshua HaMashiach. And Yeshua HaMashiach is the perfect balance of both the male and the female aspect of God in the same body. And I'm just going, uh, you're preaching doctrines of devils, Jack. By the way, do the math on this. Ten circles, 22 paths, that's 32, and when they join together, they form 33. See this one right here, and this one right here? They're, they're blazed out like the sun. There's your Antichrist right there. Right there, there's your Antichrist. That's the 11th circle that's hidden, that's not revealed until these two things come together. You know what these are in the Bible? These circles are the ten toes and the ten kings, the ten horns, angelic beings, fourth kingdom. And in Daniel chapter 2, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw said that they, these divine beings, the fourth kingdom, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The seed of men is the 22 amino acid letters that write out your genetic code, literally. 22 amino acids, which are the letters of the genetic alphabet that make up the book of your DNA. Literally, the seed of men mingled. And it's right here. 10 kings mingled with 22 amino acids, the seed of men, so that they produce this hidden Yeshua. This other Jesus right here, whose number is 33. Look at this one. I, I like this. Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. 
wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge of the fear of the Lord. 33 words exactly. I, I, I just, I love this. And, and what I'm telling you is, you look at that, you go get a King James Bible or download where it's free. What do you got to lose? What do you have to lose? And you count this yourself. Count from Genesis all the way up and stop at the 33rd book of the Bible and see whether or not it's Micah. That's all you got to do. Count these words in Isaiah 11 too, where it gives you the seven spirits of God, which are in the root of Jesse, which is Jesus Christ. And he was 33 years old when he died. And he was 33 years old when he rose again. Okay. So anyway, and I guess, I don't know, see, it's heaven and heaven's not really bound by earth time and so on. So I don't know, I guess Jesus is still 33. I mean, I don't know, you know, I know he's, I know he's timeless. I get that. All right. But count these yourself. If you don't believe what I'm saying, count them yourself. I'll, I'll give you this analogy and I like this analogy. Let's say you're walking down the street. Singing do wa diddy diddy da. No. And you look down on the sidewalk and there's a penny. And you bend over and pick it up. So now you've got a penny. And in your mind, you say, somebody dropped a penny. Now it's a penny. You don't go, oh, I want to get this. I, this, I got to get this back to the owner. Who, who dropped a penny? You're not going to get anybody except for like some four-year-old kid going, that's my penny. So you got a penny and you put it in your pocket. You walk forward 10 paces. You look down, there's another penny. You pick it up and you say, somebody must have got a hole in their pocket. Money's falling out of their, down their pant leg or something like that. Or, you know, maybe some kid dropped his pennies and, they, and you pick them up. You walk 10 more paces and there's another penny there. Now, you're thinking differently because you know that you've picked three pennies up now and they were all spaced exactly 10 paces apart. And you're going, am I on candid camera? And you, you're looking, you, it's got your curiosity going now. So you walk 10 more paces, sure enough, there's a penny, 10 more paces, there's a penny. Exactly 10 more paces. It's a penny. Somebody, and you know then for a fact. Because this is just too much in order to be an accident. See, this is how we think. If this was you, and you were picking up pennies on the sidewalk exactly 10 paces apart then you know that someone is putting these pennies on the sidewalk exactly 10 paces apart and they're doing it on purpose. So not only after having picked up 20 pennies, all of them 10 paces apart, you went from, oh, I found a penny, it was an accident. You went from the second penny, oh, somebody's dropping pennies. You got to the third one, and you realized that they were spaced apart in an even manner. And the more pennies that you picked up, your mind has gone from, well, somebody just dropped a penny, it doesn't mean anything, to somebody must be laying these pennies down in this orderly fashion. And then your mind is asking the question, why? Why are they doing this? And this is how I see the many, the many um, numbered, word, ordered, patterned sentences or whatever in the King James Bible. I didn't just find one, but it started out with one. And the first one that I ever found was, I typed in the phrase word of God to found it was 49 times. 
clicked in my mind what that number was. It was seven times seven. I went. The phrase word of God is mentioned in the King James Bible exactly 49 times, seven times seven. And now at that point, all I've done is picked up the first penny. And so I, God, I, you know, that's just pretty cool. That's seven times seven. And your word is like that, that perfect. It's purified. It's sanctified. It's been purified seven times. God, if this is just a, just a, a random, if this is just an accident, then I won't find any more. There won't be any more to find. But if there's more, will you show them to me? And he did. And I can tell you that someone placed in Isaiah 11, verse 2, exactly 33 words in that verse because it points to the stem of Jesse, Jesus Christ, who was 33 years old. It's on purpose. Because I didn't just find one pattern. I found a bunch of them. And some of you people, you're doing the same thing as me. You're counting things that I never thought to count. And you send them to me every minute and then. And I'm going, that is so cool. Mm, 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 mm. Look at this. From Adam to Abraham was 20 generations. From Isaac, Isaac was the 21st generation, Jacob 22, Judah 23. Okay? Then you have from Judah, Judah begat Perez. So you count Judah's 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, David. Is the 33rd generation from Adam. <sighs> See, that's a, that's a penny 10 paces apart. That that I've just given you is a fact. It, it's the only way it could be disputed is if you changed the order that numbers go in. If you said, well, I declare we're taking the number 33 out of all of mathematics for all the, over the world. So now David would be like 34 and you say, see, it's not 33, it's 34 now. So you'd, ha you'd have to change like times and laws, right? You'd have to change mathematics. You'd have to change everything in order to not make it work out. You go count it yourself. Start with Adam. And by the way, well, who said you could go with the generations of Adam? Uh, Jude referred to Enoch as the seventh from Adam. Now, why did he do that? Why is it important that we that Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. Why, why do we even care? God has something. Because when you start picking up all the pennies, not only does your mind tell you logically that someone must be doing this and doing it in such an order and a precise way, but then you start asking the questions, why is it like this? Why is it like there's a there's this like an unwritten rule in the law? It's like common sense, right? It's an axiom. Doesn't need to be proven. We don't need scientific experiments. And it this one of the concept one of the ways of putting it is if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know the turtle did not get up there by himself. So if you see this fence post and a turtle sitting on top, a live turtle around and you're looking. What are you looking for? I'm looking for the guy that put this turtle on here. You know it's deliberate. And these things, the more I see, the more I see the deliberation, the deliberate intent of God to give us wisdom and understanding.
by numbers and by his order. God's teaching us things because God is a God of order. Look at this. In Genesis chapter 15, the words that God said to Abram. Look at there. Fear not, I am, fear not Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. That's 12 words. Genesis 15, 4. This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Woo! Who was it that came out of Abram's bowels? It was Jesus. And God spoke exactly. Genesis 15, 1, Genesis 15, 4. Now, I didn't exclude what God said in verses 2 and 3 because he doesn't say anything there. What I took is looked at a section of the Bible and I isolated this particular story, the exact words that God said, and I added them together and you have 33 words exactly. And, though, and the wording of what God is saying is pointing you, number one, to Isaac, but then the Bible teaches us about Isaac being the child of promise, not of bondage. And Paul said that's like the two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. The difference between Isaac and Ishmael. You're going to be born in bondage? That's the law. You want to be free? Be born of Sarah. That's Isaac. And Isaac is a pro... Isaac is a proto-gospel, a, a far lower image of Jesus Christ, because in Genesis 22, Abraham takes his only son and offers him for a sacrifice. And he does so on the third day at the exact place, where Jesus, being 33 years old, was crucified and offered for the sins of mankind. Mm. See, when you just piece it all together, it just makes sense. There's nothing about what I'm telling you that contradicts anything in the Bible. They all point to the life, and the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm. Look at this. Gen I like this. I like this. Genesis 28, 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 33 words that he says. In those two verses, I isolated them, and I counted them. 33 words exactly. What did Jacob call this place? He called it Bethel. The phrase Bethel, the word Bethel, 66 times in your King James Bible. Exactly. Look it up. Get a Strong's Concordance, find the word Bethel, and count the number of occurrences that you have in the King James Bible. Because Meryl Strong did an amazing job of listing out every word in the King James and telling you where it was located. That, that must have been back before the days of television, NASCAR, football games, stuff like that. This man went to work. That's what he did. And before I ever got a computer that counted things for me, I was looking in Strong's Concordance, trying to find places where certain words were used in the Bible. I, I, this goes back to my teenage years. God was preparing me for what he's given me now. The word Bethel, the name Bethel, 67. And what does Bethel mean? Beth means house. El, you know, was Superman's dad, right? El means God. Beth El means house of God. And he said, and that's what Jacob said. He said, this is but the house of God, and this is the heaven. Why did Jacob say that? Why did he say these 33 words? What was it that he saw at that place? A ladder. He dreamed and dreamed, behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. In John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon who? 
the Son of Man. Oh, look at that. DNA is a ladder, isn't it? Do you know what it is? It's the Word of God. The gate of heaven is the Word of God. Jesus Christ, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The house of God is where the ladder is where the angels are ascending and descending on both a ladder in the Old Testament and the Son of Man in the New Testament. Just like, just like DNA. Look at this. John chapter 1 verse 3. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Ephesians 3, 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of that mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Let me show you, let me show you this. You're going to like this. Uh, my friend Al Gross, back when he was doing radio, was going to interview me. And he said, I, I want you to, uh, we have uh, Pastor Hoggard here. And he said, uh, you've been saying something on your shows about the feminazi. Feminazi sequence. And I said, no, no, it's no, no. It's not, not Feminazis. Fibonacci sequence. Let me show you this. See that swirl there? See that? See that swirl there? See it here? You see it right here? You see it right here? I want you to notice that every one of these are identical in that they exhibit a pattern that exists from the largest things in the universe, which is these galaxies, down to the smallest things in the universe, which is DNA. It is called the it's called various things. It's called phi or phi, uh, the golden ratio, God's ratio, uh, God's signature, and so on. The mathematician, Italian mathematician Fibonacci, came up with this pattern. You start with one and zero. Zero and one. And when you add zero to one, you get one. Now let's take this one and add the previous number. One plus one is two. Now let's take this number two and add the previous number. One plus two is three. Three plus two is five. Three plus five is eight. Eight plus five is 13. So when we start the spiral here, it doesn't just twirl around like a, like a screw. The threads on a screw are not a spiral in that they don't have the ratio of expansion. Here, the, the spiral expands as it goes outward. It gets bigger. And it gets bigger by an exact ratio. This pattern, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And I'll never forget it. I never made this connection. My daughter. I was, Dad, what, what was you talking about on the Watchman? I said, the Fibonacci pattern. She said, what is that? And I explained it to her. I said, it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And I was talking and she said, that's 33. And I, I went, what? She said, didn't you know that? And I said, know what? She said, if you add 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13, you end up with 33. And I went, <gasps> she said, you mean you didn't know that? I said, no. She said, you need to keep here. Because look at this. The ratio then of this wave coming off the ocean onto the beach the curl is here, and notice that it gets larger as it expands outward. Okay? By that same pattern, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Same thing here. As it unwinds, it expands. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And, you, and when you get to 13 here, notice that it tails off. Same thing here. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. By the time you get here, it tails off. Notice this one. One one two three five eight thirteen, and it, when it gets here, it tails off. Doesn't keep going. Rand's horn, same way. One one two three five eight thirteen. Notice that the verse said, "All things were made by Him, who Christ, 
and without him was not anything made that was Jesus not only made it, but he put a number on it showing his signature. And that number, when you add up the numbers as a ratio, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, you get 33. 33 here, 33 here, 33 here, 33 here. Go, go flush your toilet and see the swirl. Okay? It's 33. Man, I love this stuff. What does the number three mean? And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Three. And he was 33 years old. Wow. Here's the meaning of the number three. As it applies to both Christ dying on the cross and the Antichrist. What is one of the names of the Antichrist? The man of sin. I want you to notice this. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. There's 27 words there exactly, which is 3 times 3 times 3. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And it all has to do with seed, right? So what does Eve, what is she looking at? She's looking at a fruit that has seed in it. DNA. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's lust of the flesh, tastes good, right? And that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, that's the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Notice what John said by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. For all that is in the world, the lust of the, 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 lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Three. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we go back to Calvary. They crucify him with two thieves. There's three people on this hill. One of them's 33 years old. And he was sold for how much money? 30 pieces of Mm. Jesus was tempted how many times? Three times. Yet he was without sin. He was with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Adam the, was the first sinner. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam, his name is mentioned exactly 30 times in King James Bible. Three times ten. Then we have, we know, we know, when Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and then Abel. There is nobody on the earth right now who is related to Cain or Abel. Abel's lineage never happened. He never got a wife which would have been one of his sisters, never got a wife, never was able to pass down a, a, a bloodline. Cain slew him. There is nobody on the earth related to Abel. Nobody on the earth related to Cain. Because while Cain went on and took one of his sister wives to be with him, he had children, they had children, they had children, but... They were all destroyed in the flood. Every last one of them. So, here's Adam. Adam has something in him that causes him to have lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He's got no good thing in him. He passed it down to Cain and Abel. They're both dead. By the time the time comes around, everybody in Cain's lineage is wiped out. So who is it that we came from? Seth. We have Cain. We have Abel. We have Seth. 
we all came from they inherited from Adam our sin nature through Seth. Seth then has children and it gets all the way down to Noah. Noah has how many children? How many sons? One, two, three. Shem, Ham, Japheth. Now, everybody on planet Earth, past, present, future, all of us came from Adam through his three sons. So we have the sin nature in Adam passed down to his third son, Seth. Noah has a sin nature. We know that after the flood. He was, he was a drunkard. Noah passed on his sinful nature to his three sons. And we see in Genesis chapter 10 that those three sons basically were the fathers of all the nations in the world. Which means that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter what tribe you came from. It doesn't matter what white heritage you have. It doesn't matter if you can trace your bloodline back to British aristocracy. It doesn't matter if your great, 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 great grandfather was King Kalalua Kamamea. Doesn't matter. You received a sinful, wicked nature in you. And in that sense, the rich man is no different than the poor man. It's just that man has a lot more money to buy his sin with than the poor man does. Poor man's got to settle for a really cheap bottle of wine. Rich man can get drunk on champagne, a thousand dollars a bottle and think nothing of it. Okay. Poor man can be a whoremonger but because he ain't got no money and he probably don't have good looks and probably doesn't have good hygiene either, he has to settle for whatever's left over at the bar at 2 o'clock in the morning. Rich man can be a whoremonger and pay these really nice looking ladies $4,000 for the weekend. And what I'm telling you is it doesn't matter. You people in Kenya, listen to me. You fight amongst tribes and clans and families. And this boy here is not allowed to marry this sweet young lady here because a hundred years ago, her family put a curse on your family and you swore that your sons would never have anything to do with their daughters. And beside that, their granddaddy stole two goats from our granddaddy 40 years ago. And we're not going to forgive them. And, and every time we see them, we want to kill them. And I'm just, listen, I'm just telling you, I love, I love Kenya. I love what God has given us to minister with over there. But people... You got a sin nature just like everybody else does in this world. And you're following other tribes and in other families and other clans, obviously because you think you're better than they are. And I'm here to tell you, you're not. And neither am I. And I don't care what form racism comes in, whether it's a white man who hates the black people or it's the black people who hate the white people. By the way, that's racism. Why do you hate so-and-so? Because he's white. That's racism. Or you're in this tribe and you hate the people over on that tribe. Why? Because they're a different tribe. Let me tell you something. God has concluded every single one of us 
as under sin. Period. And when we get to heaven, I'll show it to you. Turn to Revelation 7. When we get to heaven, God is not interested in what race you're from. Revelation 7. Verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, if you go back in verse 9, it tells you who these people are in the white robes. By the way, everybody got a white robe. Every one of them. After this, in verse 8, or verse 9, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. Nations and kindreds are DNA words, Bible words. They're family clan words. And where did, where does God pick his bride for his son from? What tribe? What race? All of them. Because don't we sing the song, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I'm here to tell you, people, God has concluded every one of us under sin. And at the judgment seat of God, God is not caring what tribe, what family, what royal blood you come from. God's not going to ask what your average annual income is. God's not going to ask you how many homes you have. The only thing that God is interested in is have his sins been blotted out by the blood of of Jesus Christ, my son. That's all that God cares about. And the fact that no matter what tribe or kindred or nation you came from, we're all going to receive the exact same robe. A white one. Very quickly, three sons. Sin nature comes through the three sons of Noah. Let's go all the way down to the sons of Jacob. You have Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Levi was the third born son. What's the third book of your Bible? Leviticus. Leviticus has Levi's name in it. And by the way, Leviticus has 27 chapters in it. Exactly. Three times three times three. That's a picture of the New Testament. 27 books in the New Testament. Three times three times three. And what does the third book of the Bible teach us? It teaches us that there is a price for sin. A price to be paid. And the book of Leviticus not only teaches us that, that, that there's consequences for sin and that there has to be death. The punishment of our iniquities must be death. But in the book of Leviticus, not one time does it ever say, if you sin, you must then present yourself to the priest. He will sacrifice you on the altar. That's not what it teaches. What it teaches is there must be brought a substitute. An innocent lamb is going to take my place and receive my punishment for my sin. And I get my sins forgiven because there was a substitute to be sacrificed in my place. And it's a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, who was numbered with two other crosses, three, and he was 33 years old, and he was sold for uh, how many pieces of silver? 30 
30 pieces of silver. Okay? That's your number three. Okay? Now, when it when it pertains to the number 33 in the man of sin, or the Antichrist, it is because he is the man of sin. He's what he's going to be what everybody in this world wants. Most of the flesh, most of the eyes, pride of life. And again, I don't believe that the Illuminati soldiers are going to put assault rifles to everybody's head and say, take the mark of the beast or we'll blow your brains out. I think it's going to be just as voluntary as Eve taking that fruit down off that tree and taking a bite of it. Nobody made her. Nobody, the devil didn't hold a gun to her and say, you eat this. That's not what she was going to do. She did it on her own. Um, Thursday, I might have some new things on genetic modification. Okay, we'll see. We'll see what happens Thursday. Tomorrow, if it works out, I'll be able to record a Bible study and a Watchman broadcast. All right? Pray that my health gets better. Pray for my aches and pains. Pray for our ministry. Pray for Kenya. Remember, you're the reason why we do what we do. And we love you. Okay? Send me your emails. I don't know that I can answer all of them or see all of them. But if you send me something, try to get my attention. I'll try to talk about it on a PM. All right? I love you. God bless you. We'll see you.